All right, uh, mic check. All right. So, uh, welcome uh, to my talk. Uh, good morning. My name is Joseph. I work at PagerDuty. Uh, my talk is entitled "We'll Do It Live: uh, Testing Your Software in Production." Uh, so, just to start, uh, PagerDuty. How many people here have not heard of PagerDuty? Okay, so uh, for people that haven't heard of us, uh, we're a tool that you can use to connect uh, the monitoring tool, uh, the monitoring data and, and alerts from your monitoring services to the people that need to receive them. Um, we fill in the gap, we let the right person know when there's a problem, um, we wake you up, and we help you, our software can help you to solve the problem. So about me, I, I've been an engineer at PagerDuty for three and a half years. I work in the core, uh, on the core team, at PagerDuty. Um, this is my first time at a DevOps Days conference, and it's actually my first time in Belgium as well. Very nice to be here. So um, I'd like to start my talk with the following quote. Uh, People who don't take any risks are generally make about two big mistakes a year. People who do take risks generally make about two big mistakes a year, and this is by Peter Drucker. So the reason why I chose this quote is that my talk deals with risk, specifically risk uh, with software, uh, our perception of this risk, and what we can do to mitigate uh, the risk. Um, specifically, I'd like to talk about testing, how this pertains to testing. Uh, the idea of testing your software in production is an it can be an inherently risking risky strategy, um, but in some ways it can reduce risk, uh, and I'd like to go over that and talk about ways that we can limit that risk as well. Uh, so to begin, uh, you know, why do we test? What, uh, like, let's just talk about it from a high level. Um, I write, you know, I make a change to a piece of software uh, before I get deploy it to production. There's, you know, I test it for the following reasons. I want to make sure that my users don't have a bad experience. If I've introduced a bug, I'd like to catch it, um, you know, before the users do. Uh, it helps developers. So if there's a bug that could cause someone to get woken up in the middle of the night. We, didn't want, we don't want that to happen. I want to be a good citizen, so I try to catch that before it goes into production. Um, and there's a return on investment with you know, testing. You know, up to a certain point, I think, testing a change adds a lot of value. Um, the, the thing that I'd like to talk about is that you know, there's, for a small change, maybe testing it for five hours does not add value. So there's clearly some like, boundary there. And we'll, I'm just kind of, kind of like examine uh, a little bit about that. And um, okay, so you know, let's examine like maybe a conventional approach to testing your software changes. So I, this is something that I think when I started at PagerDuty, this is kind of the workflow that we used. So you you make some changes, you you um, add some unit tests, some uh, functional tests, some integration tests. Those get added to the code base. You test it locally in a development environment. This could be, you know, in your on your local box or using a virtual box. Uh, next, if everything looks good, you might want to promote this to a staging environment. Now, a staging environment um, is can be like a shared environment. It's something that allows you to test your software in a more production-like setting. Uh, what are the advantages here? You have uh, you know, all of the components that make up your production infrastructure should at least be represented in the staging environment, as well as any uh, dependencies, third-party dependencies that you use, other providers. Um, if everything looks good here, you might want to understand how your software change behaves under load and uh, behaves under stress. This is uh, what you would use the load test environment for. So the idea with a load test environment is something that more closely mirrors your production environment. It's something maybe of the same scale. Um, with the same number of servers, same amount of traffic, that's the general idea. Um, finally, if everything looks good, you're feeling confident that your change um, is correct and will behave well under the expected traffic conditions, it could get promoted into production. Um, this, this approach uh, is, it, you know, it, it works for us very well. The problem is we started to see that uh, it didn't. It, it wasn't scaling very well, and I'll talk a little bit about the scaling challenges with staging first. So, you know, when we when I started at PagerDuty, we were a smaller team. There wasn't a lot of contention for this, the staging environment, and we only had one staging environment. Um, as we added more developers, uh, suddenly, you know, people had to wait longer and longer to access staging. Someone was testing something. You kind of have this. Uh, 
effect where sometimes a person would have to wait like a full day to test their change. So people get blocked, they have to change contacts. It's kind of disruptive. So what did we do? Our first uh, approach was actually to introduce more staging environments. So we went from staging one to staging two, et cetera. Um, another problem here is that uh, your, your staging environment can often be broken. Um, as your so service, uh, as your software service might go from like a single monolithic application to multiple microservices, um, and you have multiple people deploying changes to each of those microservices and staging, you can easily enter a state where one of those services is broken. Um, often, what we were finding is that developers uh, had to spend a lot of their time that they um, normally should have been spending testing their changes, fixing the staging environment. So you had a couple of costs here. One, the time that the developer has to spend waiting, and two, the t amount of time that a developer has to spend fixing what's broken. Uh, this involves another context switch. So this is another sort of problem with our uh, staging approach. Um, load test, uh, this also added a lot of value. We were able to um, test a lot of our you know, capacity, do a lot of capacity testing in load test. Um, but we, we found that it also had some challenges. So to begin with, we had the same kind of staling, scaling and contention problems that we had with staging. Um, and then on top of that, we had the challenge of maintaining uh, a data set in, in load test that was representative of, of our production data, data set. So you know, you, to, to do that, and, the, and this is something you'd want to do in a load test environment because it allows you to simulate your, um, your software with the correct data set, uh, you have to set up a process for replicating the data or, or transferring the data to load test. Um, this can be like a weekly process, a daily process, uh, but it, you know it's something that another kind of moving part. You have to keep in mind that you probably want to scrub any personally personal identifiable information from this data set. Uh, you don't. It's generally a bad practice to have you know user information in your testing database. Uh, and uh, and then if it, if it's not done well, uh, you can run into problems where you know I'm testing a software change, but I um, I'm missing some configuration data in my database because it hasn't been replic uh, moved, uh, replicated from production. And so I infer that there's a problem with my software change when really it's just an environment problem. Um, you have to then think about, OK, how do I make sure that the scale of my load test environment is representative of production? Um, for us, up until this year, that meant one-to-one um, -one changes. Whenever we introduced a new service, um, or a new host for a service in production, we would do the same in load test. This gets really expensive really quickly. And so uh, you know, earlier this year, we made the decision that this is no longer, we're no longer getting the uh, amount of value that uh, we think we're getting out of load test from, from uh, maintaining the same fleet side, so we um, cut it dramatically. Uh, finally, the problem of like representative or realistic traffic. So uh, one of the premises here with load testing is that you have traffic that is is kind of like realistic. It represents what you you would be seeing in production. Uh, if you think about all of the sources of your uh, production traffic, it could be via your API, via your um, uh, users interacting via a mobile app. Uh, you could have background cron jobs. You could have a database that's in a, a kind of like different initial state from the database that you're uh, testing and load test, you, you, you start to realize that this is a complicated problem. Uh, we actually spent some time developing a tool for simulating load tests, uh, for simulating uh, production life traffic in load test. But um, you know this, and the tool was proved to be somewhat useful. But I feel like we're still no closer to actually represent uh, having representative traffic in load test, um, and it's just kind of like the nature of the beast. <sighs> Um, so some other approaches that you can use to testing your software, um, if you if you find uh, if you're kind of running into the same kind of constraints that I described with staging and load test workflow, uh, virtual machines. So the idea here is that uh, I would uh, de deploy my change to a a kind of a, a, a virtual copy of what um, of, of a of a host on my local machine. Uh, so, you know, this this like uh, the virtual machine that I'd be deploying to, is something that you know would have some production-like characteristics, but not be fully production-like. 
the idea of an ephemeral pre-production uh, uh, deploy strategy is that you actually spin up an entire copy of your uh, you know, uh, staging or load test environment just to test one change on. So press a, I, I have a change that I want to test, press a button, I have a new fleet to test it on, test the change, and then tear it down. Um, and then finally, I'd like to talk about the strategy of testing in production. So uh, the virtual mach machine strategy I, th I sort of covered, it scales well. Uh, you don't have the contention problem. Uh, but uh, I'd say the challenge is it's very difficult to kind of get uh, it to look production-like. Um, but it, it's definitely valuable, and this is something that we do at PagerDuty. Um, the ephemeral pre-prod strategy. So this is uh, also, uh, it's all, it kind of meets the same criteria. So you don't have contention, it scales well. It looks like production, but it's very difficult. And you know, the, for a small change, this can be kind of time consuming, to, um, depending on how, how um, it would work exactly. But it's, it's challenging operationally. Um, and uh, you, you run into similar problems that you do in load test as well. So um, for some, you know, for some pro software projects and for some changes to uh, a piece of software, the idea of testing and production can be very uh, p uh, powerful and very appealing. The big advantage here is that the workload and the environment are realistic. Um, errors that you might not catch in staging or load test can can be caught here, just because, uh, you know, things that you wouldn't think to simulate in those environments would happen here. Um, the powerful idea here is that it can shorten the development cycle and allow your team to iterate more quickly. Um, the milder version of this strategy is that you just spend less time in pre-production and you basically aim to get your software in production as quickly as possible um, after it meets the minimum amount of kind of correctness testing. Um, the challenges are obvious. Uh, any bugs introduced here um, to your production environment can impact users and it can be very difficult to do well. So it's, it, we're kind of in a situation where we want the benefits of um, uh, this very pr production-like environment testing, but we kind of want to minimize the risks. So the question is, how do you do that well? How do you minimize those risks? Um, I'd, I'd like to think that this falls under three categories. So reducing risk uh, means I know uh, as soon as something breaks that something has broken, and I know that the impact of anything that I've broken with my change is limited, and I know that it's easy to roll back. So how do you know when something breaks? Uh, I think this is kind of like wall-covered ground for uh, the DevOps community. You want to make sure your software is instrumented. Uh, you have monitoring, your software being monitored. Uh, you're utilizing like log aggregator tools. Um, and you might want to consider an alerting tool as well. Um, there's a few on the market. Uh, so what else? How else can we do this? I, I'd like to uh, actually point out a system, or highlight a system that we use uh, at PagerDuty. Uh, this is something we developed internally. It's for production end-to-end -end functional testing. The idea here is that you treat your entire software product as a black box and you have t tests that are constantly uh, being executed against it. Uh, basically, the way that we did this is we enumerated, these are the behaviors that we expect our software product to always have. Um, this is what we believe to always be true. We wrote tests that uh, captured that behavior, or captured that um, expected behavior, and we run those um, using like a cron-like process as frequently as is reasonable against our software system. Um, the, the big idea here is that as soon as something has changed, as soon as you've gone from a good state to a bad state, someone gets alerted as quickly as possible. Um, we affectionately call this watchdog, so it's like watching our, uh, our software product for us. Um, so, you know, if you're confident that you know that you'll be, you'll find out quickly as soon as there is a problem, let's think about how you limit the impact. Here's another uh, popular tool uh, that's used, in, I guess, um, in the industry. It's kind of this idea of doing a canary deploy. So you know that um, only a certain percentage of your hosts are going to get the software update when it's first deployed, and therefore only a certain number of 
um, traffic, a certain percentage of traffic is going to see this new version. In this diagram, I've highlighted um, the new version being uh, like V prime, the current version being V, and we've deployed the new version to a subset of the hosts. So um, another, another way you can do this is at the uh, code execution level. So you have selectivity with your code. Um, some, some users of the code uh, see cert, uh, v, version V of the software. Most of the users see version V, and the, some subset of them see a V prime, which is the change. Uh, how do we do this at, at PagerDuty? So uh, we actually first deploy changes to internal users. So internal users are the first kind of uh, subset of users to see any changes to production. Then we have kind of a group of beta users, people that have signed up uh, for to be part of our beta program. They're the next subset of users that would see changes. And um, finally, once things look good for both of those groups, we release it to the general group, or our general user base. Um, finally, you want to know that if you've deployed a change that has broken your product for some users, uh, that you can get back to a good state as quickly as possible. Uh, the idea here is uh, friction-free deploys, and you know what this means is that it can be like one single button deploy. Uh, I click a button to deploy, I click a button to roll back. I want uh, boring, unexciting deploys and rollbacks. Uh, automation can help, although this is a uh, this can be more difficult to fully automate. The the way, what we're actually trying to do at PagerDuty, what we've currently implemented is we have a build pipeline that builds, uh, that tests our, um, tests any change uh, against a set of unit tests, builds the deployment artifact, does a canary deploy, um, observes the behavior of the deployed artifact against production traffic for a period of time, and then decides whether to roll back um, at, to a known good state or to deploy fully this change. The next uh, thing I'd like to talk about is kind of the cultural aspect, uh, the cult you know, what uh, sort of mentality you need to have as a company to, to try a strategy like this. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is the mantra uh, that Werner Vogels first, I guess, set, or said best, uh, you build it, you run it. So basically, if I'm the software developer, I make a change, I know that I'm going to be on the line, I'm going to get alerted if something breaks. Uh, the second thing is you want to kind of like think about your risk tolerance as a company. And this has two dimensions. Uh, so one, what is, how much risk are you willing to take in terms of exposing a subset of your users to a potential uh, breaking change versus what is the risk associated with not moving quickly enough? Um, and uh, you, you, you know, there's a kind of like a different balance for different companies and for uh, different people. But you kind of have to evaluate your balance there and and uh, and determine what uh, what works for you. Uh, as part of that, I think it's important to quantify. So, like, think about what would be uh, what would kind of like the maximum amount of bad user experience that we can tolerate. So, whether that's like 0.1 percent of your customers experiencing 10 minutes of a bad user experience, is that does that your threshold, or you, you kind of have to think through those numbers. So um, I guess like thinking about what this could actually work well with versus what it could, you know, might not be a good fit for. Um, something that occurs to me is like the, you know, the a new feature. So I'm I'm deploying a new feature uh, to my software product. This is something that you know users don't have an expectation for right away. They aren't relying on. Um, this would be an ideal candidate. Uh, the, and the next thing would be like an incremental change. So I have, you know, I'm going from state A with my software to state B, and I've broken that up into a subset of small changes. This could be a useful way to, um, testing in production could be a useful way to make these changes, um, because we know that we've already limited the risk by breaking the change up, and uh, each change is going to be much smaller. Uh, finally, you might want to think about like a new service. So here, it's it's something that would be you know uh, uh, receiving production traffic uh, when deployed to production, but users are not actually exposed to the outputs of this service right away. And you know, deploying the service, 
quickly to production would have you know very limited downside. Um, what would be challenging? So I mean, uh, something like mobile app releases are very challenging for the strategy because there's no uh, rollbacks don't work well with um, mobile applications. Something like a bank machine. So on that risk spectrum, uh, a, a bank would probably err on the side of not breaking things ever uh, because there's you know kind of bad consequences. Um, and and you know same thing for like a rocket. If I'm deploying a rocket, that's probably not a good strategy. Um, so, you know, uh, I'll talk about the experience that we had with kind of moving towards the strategy at PagerDuty. Um, we experienced a lot of the pr frustrations that uh, I described earlier. Uh, we, you know, kind of view our product in some ways, like some parts of it, as a bank machine, so we really don't want to break it. Um, but some parts uh, of it are, you know, less sensitive. And a reality in our industry is that you know competition is real, so we have to keep moving and we have to move quickly. Um, at the end of the day, there are differences by team. Some teams are, uh, you know, err towards more of a conventional strategy. Some teams um, are more uh, willing to uh, use a strategy like this. The team that I work for, we optimize for shipping to production as quickly as possible, um, and you know we don't have our our software is not actually customer facing, so that's e easier for us. Um, but as a whole, the company has moved towards making smaller and more incremental changes, and we've, uh, you know, consciously tried to uh, move to 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 uh, tracking this as well. So here, I have a graph that I, is just like a snapshot from a, a monitoring tool. We're kind of capturing by service for three of our services how many times a day we're deploying, and this these are deploys that are going through our the, the deployment pipeline that I described. And the reason I bring this up is just to show that you know changes like this can happen, and we've changes like this have happened at, at uh, our organization. Um, just to dig a little fur further into this, um, uh, I'll, I'll sh kind of describe two examples. So I call this the tale of two services. Um, the first uh, was in 2014. So this is a project that I was a part of. It's a backend service for notifications. Um, at, with this project, we really used the uh, kind of conventional approach to uh, testing changes, in this case for testing this new service. So before the service was deployed, we had built a full uh, copy or replica of the fleet, the production fleet in load test. We had established benchmarks for you know, kind of the behavior of the service, and we uh, you know, spent several weeks testing, doing load testing of this new service uh, you know, so getting back to the quote that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, two big mistakes, did that happen in this case? Yes, absolutely. Once the service got into production, there were things that happened that we hadn't anticipated with our load testing. Um, the cost here is time. The return on investment, it's debatable whether you know we really realized uh, the, an appropriate amount of return for the amount of time that we invested with this testing. Uh, so, and then I'll talk to you about a project that I worked on uh, earlier this year. So this was actually in July. Um, this is a service, you know, uh, that also works in the back end. And in this case, we followed the strategy that I described of deploying a new service to production when the output of the service was not actually being, uh, you know, uh, relied on. Uh, so that's what we did. We we got it to production. We developed it and got it to production within a few weeks. Um, it was kind of uh, the the attitude of the team was best captured with this uh, quote that I pulled from Slack that someone said in Slack, "Production is the best load test, anyways." Um, so getting you know getting back to that quote again from the beginning, did we make two big mistakes? Yes, for sure. What's the difference here? Time. So we had you know we saved a lot of time. We did not go, you know set up a lot of red tape for ourselves um, to, in terms of uh, barriers to getting to production. We got there as quickly as possible, and we learned those mistakes, and then we improved the service. Um, so, you know, just basically, I'll I'll go over a little bit of uh, you know the what I what we've talked about today. So, I talked about uh, conventional approaches to to testing software changes and the limitations associated with these approaches. Um, I've described the you know we were talking about the advantages of testing in production and why um, this. 
you know, this uh, seemingly risky strategy can actually reduce risk in other ways. And we looked at some actual examples. Um, to conclude, I'd actually like to tell you the story uh, a little different. It's a tale of a bridge. Um, so here is a, a picture of this bridge. This bridge spanned the Ohio River. It was named the Silver Bridge. Um, it was built in 1928 and it collapsed during rush hour in 1967. So uh, the failure was actually due to a small defect in one of the I-bar. Um, so the I-bar is basically a, a weight bearing, and in the case of this bridge, uh, component of the bridge. It was actually a bad design, and the bad design was actually revealed by the amount of load placed on the bridge in 1967. You see this bridge was de designed in an age where automobiles were a lot, weighed a lot less, and um, the original designers hadn't accounted for the additional weight of uh, 1967 vehicles. So you had a situation in rush hour, a lot of cars on the bridge, not moving, something broke. You, can you, you, know, you might say that there's a load testing failure here. <laughs> um, so there's an engineering historian, Henry Petrowski, and um, his statement on the legacy of this bridge was that uh, it should be to remind engineers to proceed always with the utmost caution, ever mindful of the possible existence of unknown unknowns and the possible consequences of even the smallest design decisions. So uh, in view of, I, of what we discussed today, I would um, submit that software is not like this. Um, you know, the deploy mechanism with a bridge and software are quite different. Uh, you know, you, the rollback strategy with bridges, very difficult. Um, the, you know, bad, bad deploys for a bridge can be a disaster. With software, I offer that we can manage um, bad deploys. Um, and the approach, uh, the approach that an engineer might take when designing a bridge would be for, that it ne for it to never fail, whereas with software, the idea here is to fail fast. So overall, I'd say the risk approach a risk-averse approach that many engineers learn in school is better suited to building bridges than it would be to building software. Thank you very much. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? Questions. There's one right there. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, first of all, I like the culture of uh, you, you build it, you run it. It's good. Now, my question is uh, regarding rollbacks. I understand that when you have a uh, functionality that doesn't work, it's not that difficult to roll back. But when you identify that you have corrupted data or you have messed up with the schemas on the database, what is the strategy to roll back in this case? Do you come back to the previous stable backup or do you try to carry on and then uh, fix it? How do you guys do it? Yeah, it's hard to generalize. Uh, this is actually something that I've encountered several times in my career. Um, generally, you want to have a well-defined idea of, OK, first deploy the, I mean, depending on the situation, it can be first deploy the schema change, and that's kind of a global change. And that would be something that you'd want to test for sure in a pre-production environment. Uh, and, and then you can incrementally deploy the code change. Uh, it's hard to, uh, I would say it's hard to answer more general, uh, at a general level, because it could be situational dependent. What we've done is kind of codify steps in our internal documentation for uh, situations like that. You know, you, you'd want to do X and then Y and then Z type of thing. Um, yeah, that would be a case where it may not be, uh, a schema change is not something that I would uh, think that you could incrementally deploy. More questions? Um, where do you see the balance between uh, rolling back uh, after failure and uh, rolling forward to a, to a quick fix? So you, uh, you have this uh, pipeline to, to get uh, uh, functionality quick, quickly into production. So at a certain point, it makes sense to have a fix quickly to production and then roll forward. But is there a balance between uh, rolling back and rolling forwards? Yeah, I would say during the course of my career, I've seen cases where both strategies would be more appropriate. Um, in you, depending on how you've set up your pipeline, the roll forward approach, you might need some type of like deploy fast mechanism. So you don't want to go through every step there. You kind of want it to get out as quickly as possible. Um, 
uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, situation by situation, I'd say it could be different, but I've seen cases where both are appropriate uh, and we've done you know both, both solutions. More questions? Oh. Okay, thank you, Joseph.